in Boston, Paul Pierce eventually, uh, Antoine Walker, Kenny Anderson, and others. What do you remember about those guys and just especially the young Paul Pierce? How did he impress you? Unbelievable because I remember watching him in, in, um, in college and the tournament and stuff and him getting drafted and him coming in. And we used to call him bad body. He had like a janky game where he didn't really look athletic. And then he would just take off and be like, ugh. So at first we were like, this dude is like bad. We called him bad body P because he just, he didn't have an NBA body, but he was athletic as hell. And he did just, we just didn't know it. So it was amazing to watch him grow. And we had, and we played a crazy game because we had Rick Pitino as a coach, you know, um, those years. I had ML for three years with, with Antoine Walker for three years. And then um, and, and Rick Pitino came in. I had him for three years where, where uh, Paul was his rookie. So he got to play open and free. We pressed, you know what I mean, almost the whole year. And he was just amazing to watch, man, watch him grow into being an all-star and just the player that he was and just eventually a Hall of Famer, you know. 2000 stabbing incident. I know you were close with Paul back then, and he miraculously recovered 11 stab wounds, wounds excuse me, 82 games, 25 points per games per game 6.4 rebounds three assists talk about his resilience for coming back with all that and you know overcoming all that adversity paul was my best friend me me paul and eric williams hung out every single game like we barely didn't even go out on the road we just sat there and played sacred genesis football all the time sitting in the hotel room so i was with paul the whole night um i had just had a baby or my wife was pre pregnant, one or the other. And I am, and so I'm like, all right, man, it's like 10.30, I'm out, I'm going home. I'm not going to the club. You know, we were hanging out, eating, and, and um, just playing at Sega at the crib. And they're like, I'm, all right, so I'm out, I went home. By the time I get home, not even 45 minutes later, you know, I get the call about what happened. And um, so me being his boy, his best friend at the time, I'm at his house every single day. And, um, and I had, um, a license to carry since I came from 89. I've had one ever since. So I always had it on me. If he got off the plane, I would walk him back to the crib until he got his all the security set up with his people and his thing. So for like a couple of weeks, I did that. That was my man. And this is how much respect I have for him and salute to him because I remember being at his house and people calling like, like saying it wasn't over. You know what I mean? Like, and he was, like, nah, he called, I remember him calling Dave, like, nah, I'm not, I don't want to be traded. I'm going to stay right here. I'm going I'm to go face to face with this NBA. I'm going to be back next year on time and I'm going to get busy. And I remember me living here, we worked out a lot during the off season. And I just, again, salute to him because he, he was like, nah, I'm not, I don't want to get traded. Because they was, you know, everybody was like, hey, man, you think it's best if you go. And I, he was like, nah, I'm good. You know, and I just... I have so much respect for him for that, you know. I saw a recent interview with him about it where he broke down, you know. It, he was depressed for a lot of years after that, and it seemed like basketball was his escape. He said he even carried after that. I'm sure you would know that being behind the scenes yeah. with him. Talk about the, you know, the aftermath of that emotionally and maybe conversations you had with him back then about that. Yeah, I mean, just think about being a young kid. He had just bought his first house. Um beautiful house right next to the facility. And um, he wasn't like a guy that had a whole bunch of dudes around and all that. He was coming to hoop, you know what I mean? He might have his mom in town or his girl in town for a couple of days or a week or whatever, but he was hooping. He was going to the gym and coming right back around the corner to, to home. So to have that happen and, you know, to be such a free person, you know, like that, to not even want to be at the crib, you know what I mean? He's got a you know, he doesn't have houses all around him. He's Paul Pierce. He's got a nice crib. He's got some land. So I just couldn't imagine that, you know, being at home, not even knowing, sleeping, like you hear a little crack and you're like jumping up with the banger. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's how I would be. So again, it's just, it's, it's a, a tribute to his resiliency. And again, to young kids out there, like this is, this is how we get to this level. We have issues and we take basketball, we put it into a little bubble you know, and we make basketball our life because we have things outside of, of that bubble that are forcing us to block them things out. And this is the only escape we have. And that's why a lot of players get to the where they are in life, not just sports. It's just they have the ability to focus in that oneness, you know what I'm saying, to, to take all the issues and turn it into, turn that stress or that pressure into something positive, you know.